everyone. I hope you're here to hear about Ed Connolly and not who's going to win the Super Bowl. I can't see who you are. Long time no see. So I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Carolyn Gould. I'm president of the Chittenden County Historical Society. And um, I'm just going to make a few comments uh, before introducing Elise Goyette, who is going to um, introduce our speaker. Um, just some um, basic information. The women, no, the boys and girls bathrooms are in the front. You take a right. Go to the left for the boys and the right for the girls. And um, we have refreshments afterwards for all of you. Um, and I want to thank Isabella from Town Meeting TV who is recording this presentation. We are now recording all of our presentations. And we post uh, the link on Facebook. We're also going to put it up on our website, which is cchsvt.com. Org. And you can find information posted there. You can also find ways of joining our organization. If you're interested in taking a more active part and would like to serve on a committee or to uh, maybe join as a member of the board, please contact me. My name's all over the place. And, but it would be cgould, cch president at gmail.com. We'd love to talk to you. Um, the Chittenden County Historical Society is a content-driven organization. We don't have a museum, but we do have a bulletin that appears five times a year, and we have these talks that happen about every other month. So we also give research grants to lay historians or to professional historians, but generally lay historians, who are looking to research a specific topic about Chittenden County history. And the uh, deadline for next year's uh, awards is June 1st, and the person to contact is Tom Donahue. Raise your hand, Tom. Um, and currently, we've been um, the East Monitor Barn. I don't know how many of you have heard about the East Monitor Barn. Well, one of the people there who is working on it has this year's yeah. grant recipient. Great. And he's going to be doing a presentation probably next year on Charles Miller, who is one of the few barn architects we know of. Most barns were built by the community. And so we're really looking forward to this. Um, I'd like to, first of all, dedicate this presentation. I never do this. This is a one-off. But I'm dedicating this presentation to my friend Pam Pospisil's guide dog, Bianca. <laughs> and this is not Bianca. This is like Bianca, Pam and I, and her husband Bill, met as members of the Dragon Heart Vermont Dragon Boat Racing Team. And we went to Hungary in 2018 to participate in the Club Crew World Championship. And Bianca came to every practice, and Bianca went to Hungary. And so Bianca was so beloved by all of us that when she passed, it was horrible for Pam, but it was also really sad for all of us who just loved this dog. And now, a couple of years later, light has come into her life as light. Pam's guide dog, who's here to today. So I just wanted to make that dedication, because how often do you get to acknowledge a dog? <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. Um, so without any more blithering on my part, I'd like to introduce one of our board members, Elise Gayette, who has put together this presentation. And Elise. Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so it's, it, how many people have been in the high school before? 
I have. Uh, so it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yes, it is. Seeing yeah. the architecture and how they put it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and they have donated the space to us, so thank you very much to Burlington High School for donating um, everything that had to do with this, um, this program. And I'm so happy, it is my pleasure um, to introduce John Thomas, who is currently the Director of Development for the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. He's originally from Ohio. Um, he's lived in Vermont since 1992 and has a BA and an MA in History from the University of Vermont. Over the years, he tells us, he has worked on many social and cultural uh, history projects, including Burlington's Urban Renewal, UVM student movements and protests, the Masonic influence on early UVM, and his graduate thesis focused on the meditative practices of 19th century Protestant women. <laughs> it sounds like you could be giving a lot of talks <laughs> to the County Historical Society, but one of his proudest to be a part of history projects was spearheading the fifth grade student history project in South Burlington Central School to rally the community to support the developers' interests in raising the school for support. That's not the right. It was to uh, <laughs> counter the developers' interest in raising the school. Right, yes. exactly. So now Central School was saved um, uh, thanks to the student work. He's married and has two amazing and brilliant daughters. Are either of them here? Uh, no. <laughs> the story of Ian Connolly that he's uh, telling today is a part of a larger project uh, to create more awareness of and accessibility in Burlington for those with impaired vision. Uh, please welcome John Thomas. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to test my mic levels. Is this better or is it better if I just speak like this? Microphone? Yeah. Microphone? All right, excellent, thank you. So uh, thank you everybody for being here on this beautiful sunny Super Bowl Sunday. This will, that will be the second funnest thing of today. This will be number one, you will find out. So um, I, I'm honored to be here to get to tell the story of Ann Connolly because she, um, she's an important person in Vermont history. There was a time when, I don't know if it's fair to say most people, but I think most people in Vermont knew her. She was a celebrity in the state and she's been forgotten. Um, in the history of what she helped create. I work for the organization that she helped breathe life into. She's the living experience that informs much of what we do, and she was lost in time. Um, so this is a new story for all of us, and I'm glad that you're here to hear it, and I hope that I can um, uh, correct some of the record. She deserves to be known about and honored for the work that she did, as well as some other people who helped um, what she did take place. So I want to explain a little bit about my slideshow. Um, this is maybe the, the most beautiful slide. It's more of a slideshow to keep me on track and from digressions and to keep the story going. So there, it, my resources for this, number one is a newspaper database. So you're going to find this is sort of like a scrapbook of newspaper clippings. Um, and Please, nobody feel that you need to read all of them, because I probably will go past the slide before you're done reading. If you want a copy of my slides, I'm happy to get that for you. Um, but I'm not putting a slide up hoping everybody's going to read these articles, because some of them are kind of long, and they're just to kind of keep me talking about some points that I probably will forget. So that's explaining my slideshow. And I also need to mention that I'm going to be talking about the beginnings of a little bit about them, of two organizations that are alive and well today and integral to the health and well-being of the Vermont community. This story takes place more than 100 years ago. Uh, none of the people in these organizations knew about Ann Connolly. So any painful or uncomfortable pieces of the story cannot be blamed on anybody today. And uh, this is my disclaimer, so I have a job at the end of my presentation. So. Uh, the VABVI and the DBVI, which is our state counterpart, um, do incredible work. And their success, longevity, stability, begin with Ann Connolly's experience. So it's, um, you know, we can all guess at the end why she might have been forgotten in the story. So um, I guess that's it. So I can jump in. Um, Ann Connolly.
This is her, this is a picture of her taken in 1931. Pioneer the unorganized area, which will be, uh, make sense a little bit later on. And she's the first field teacher for the Vermont Association for the Blind. She's born in Scranton, Pennsylvania. She's born blind, 1889. As far as I know, she has a mom, dad, and one sister, but I know very little about her family. Uh, she, she said she had no formal education until she entered the Overbrook School. It's the Pennsylvania Institution for Instruction of the Blind at Overbrook. Uh, she enters there when she's 12. So this place started in 1832. It's an old institution. It just moved to this large facility outside Philadelphia in 1899. So I think this is right after, Ann goes there, I think, right after this place happens, um, or they moved to this large facility. I didn't include all the pictures. This is a very impressive place, and uh, they teach all sorts of skills for blind people to learn to hopefully go out and find employment with. Overbrook became famous for teaching blind students to become athletes. All of these grounds, this is an older picture, these get converted to athletic fields around the place. Um, and it's, it's still out there today. Um, so she's there at age 12. This is a bit of her timeline before she goes to Vermont. So she enters Overbrook at age 12. Her father passes away when she's 14, leaves the family with no financial support, and learns the handicrafts at the school that she then makes and sells over the summers to earn, she pays for her own clothing and the railroad fare back to school. Uh, graduates, graduates from Overbrook, 1909, at the age of 19. Her first job, this is all coming from her own story. And I have to say, the one person who'd be so excited to have her story told would be Ann Connolly, because she's told her story many, many times in the paper, Vermont paper. So, she, uh, when she graduates, she's first trained for a while to care for a child with disabilities. That didn't last long. She entered into the Westchester State Normal School. She says she's the only blind student there out of like 987 students. I rounded up to 1,000. Uh, she's there for a year. She said this was to help her learn to be around a predominantly sighted population. She then goes on, she's employed for two years by the Catholic Institute for the Blind in New York. She's a teacher of manual training. So manual training is her, it's what she's learned at Overbrook, and it's her teaching others to cane chairs, to weave, uh, to sew, she types. She knows Braille, she also knows something called the Moon's writing system, it's a raised writing system. Um, there are other things, there's a, in the, it's called manual training, it's also called handicrafts. I'll refer to this work as handicrafts because it kind of changes depending on where it's being um, employed and what kind of facilities they have. But, so it's easier to say handicrafts. And then after she's two years at the Catholic Institute, she enters the lighthouse. That's in New York City uh, to study basketry, weaving, switchboard operating, braille shorthand, and typewriting. So the lighthouse has a pivotal impact on who she is, what she goes on to do, who she is as an adult, what she does in Vermont. Two years in the White House, big impact on Anne. Uh, among the things there that really influence her, and I'll explain more about the White House a couple slides forward, she is there working in programs that are completely run by blind people. And she also joins women's clubs there uh, that are blind women, so they're sharing ideas of the day, they talk about whatever is going on at the time. And so what's going on at the time? Progressive era. Um, just quickly over it, maybe everybody in here knows this already. And what's really great about this room, if you haven't seen this history timeline, we're in that corner over there. So the progressive era, 1890 to 1920s, this is essentially, you know, Anne's born in 1889. She's born and she's growing up. She is formed by the progressive era. Progressive era is marked by, it's a period of social reform, predominantly uh, led by many strong social reform-minded women. Uh, they're dealing with social problems that come out of the late 19th century industrialization. And this is just a few I listed up there. Workers' rights, consumer protections, increased aid to people in need. There's a lot of charity work. Um, they're beginning to look around and see so many people are in need. This is, you know, this is post-Robber Baron era. They want to do something to help. Reform in women's clothing. 
That's a great one. Corsets are extremely bad for women's health. And uh, so there's a reform movement to get rid of those. Many more reforms. Actually, I know we have a lot of historians in here. So the progressive area, does anybody have some favorite aspect of the progressive era they want to shout out? What's a reform that took place then? The suffrage. suffrage. Yes, yeah, suffrage, women's right to vote. That's, and that's interesting because that's a huge push. And a number of these groups will get together and say, okay, first thing, we're gonna talk about our cause, but we can't tie it to suffrage. So that's a real dividing point for some people. In Vermont, they have anti-suffrage groups because they don't want to be associated with being radicals. Female activists established new professions in social work and public health. Jane Addams in Chicago in the Hull House. That is hugely influential uh, in the late 19th century, shaping these women who come and are doing more reform work at the turn of the century. Hull House is created to help poor women and children. Um, it actually, I think, is where the field of social work develops. I think the, the position of social worker comes out of Hull House. It's hugely influential. Anne Connolly grows up in this area. She's, in, she's shaped by all of these ideas. She's shaped by these strong women around here, shaped by the social milieu, milieu and movements of the time in addition to her personal experiences. This is crucial at the bottom. Anne is helped through her career by strong, reform-minded women. Um, as you'll see throughout this. She works with women's groups. Pretty much everything she's done, or she will go on to do, she's helped by a single influential woman or women's groups. Is she, is she uh, doing this in New York? Um, yes, at that point, that formation's happening in New York. The Lighthouse, she spends two years in New York, and she goes from the Lighthouse to Vermont. So the, those two formative years, I think so, yeah, yep. Uh, so among the influential women of the period and in our story is Winifred Holt. She is the, she's the daughter of Henry Holt. He is a, a well-to-do, successful publisher in New York City in the late 19th century. He has a summer home in Burlington. This is how, they, how the story reaches Vermont. The Holts summered in Vermont starting in the 1870s. Winifred tells a story of uh, a, a favorite childhood story is them being at Lake Dunmore and her having a toothache, which forced her parents to take her on a long carriage ride to Middlebury. And it was magical. And she talks about this as this really great childhood experience. So they have a long connection to Vermont. Um, she is the founder of the Lighthouse. And I have to quickly tell you this story because it's a great story. Winifred Holt and her siblings are born into privilege. They um, are wealthy. Their father is a wealthy guy. They're also very, the, the Holts are artistic. They're cultured. They raise their kids with knowledge of classical music and opera and sculpture. And they're being exposed to a number of um, great cultural leaders. So these kids have this unique upbringing and of privilege. And jumping forward quickly, Winifred and her sister are in, they're touring around Europe. They're looking for a place to study Italian, so they end up in Italy. And, and these are the kind of things they can do. When her mother dies, the doctor tells her dad, like, you, you're experiencing grief, you need to go to Europe and just seclude yourself. So they do this all the time. The son, one of the sons has an interest in classical music, so he and his sister just tour Europe finding the greatest concerts that they can. It's like 1901 or so. So anyhow, Winifred and her sister are in Italy studying Italian and they go to an opera and they see a group of people led in, seated, and they watch them through this and they are watching the, th it's, uh, I think it's a group of young men. They're really enjoying the show and they discover in this that this group of young men, they're blind. And so her story is that she's, she's watching and she's telling her sister, look at this, look at this. And she's already, she's had a, an earlier experience in the state where she is, tuned into the needs of the blind. So she's sitting there in this opera house, seeing these blind kids enjoying the show, and she asks about it afterwards. She asks why are they there or how they came in, and she learns that there's a program in Venice where they take extra, they have tickets set aside for the blind to come to the shows. And Winifred and her sister are amazed, and they are, you know, this is this point where she just gets her passion for what she does the rest of her life. She, she says, we're going to go back to New York and we're going to create this kind of a club in New York City. We can do this. 
and her sister agrees with her just by squeezing her hand. That's what Winifred says. So um, they come back and she does this. They go around, they find their extra tickets. They try to get tickets for everything from theater to academic lectures, anything that's educational that can um, deliver culture to people. Uh, she gets all of these tickets. She gets this idea. She hands it over to the New York, I think it's called, the New, she refers to the New York School of the Blind. I'm, I'm not that familiar with it. But what she says is they said, thanks, we'll take it from here. And weeks go by and nothing happens, nothing happens. And she realizes that nothing's going to happen. That, if she writes this in her biography, that there are the, the benevolent, well-meaning keepers of the blind who really don't like these folks, her and her sister showing up with a new idea that's gonna ask them to do something different. And what they're doing is saying, um, blind people can come out and attend all of these social events. They should be part of what we're doing. That's really what they're proposing. And, the, and she says the school was there keeping blind people kind of locked away. So it's an interesting thing that she realizes. And she goes back and, um, well, she doesn't go back. She just takes her idea back and her and her sister put it together. So they put this club together that's for blind people in New York to get free tickets to go to the theater. And they discover very quickly that blind people, as they told her, we love to be you know, going to the shows, but we would really like to get jobs. Much of our time is spent in idleness. Social isolation is a huge part of blindness, and they learn about this. Winifred and her sister learn about it. Um, so they, they realize they need to form something else. They end up forming the New York Association for the Blind, which was meant to focus on employment and how they can help blind people find employment it then leads to her uh, learning how to cane chairs and doing all that uh, handicraft work. And she starts to train some blind people in her house. She actually goes to a school to learn how to do it. She comes back, this is from England. She comes back, sets up her first practice effort in her house. She teaches a few blind people. She teaches them to teach others. And really from there, it spreads into what becomes an international movement. It's an international, Lighthouse International grows from Winifred's one table in one room in her house. Her story is funny, it takes over. Uh, the word lighthouse was given by the blind people who were coming from New York to go to the Holtz house because it's, it's a happening. This is, if you read it, it, it could be 1967 London. They're showing up there, all these blind people are meeting other blind people. You have the Holtz who are supporting them, who are encouraging them, they're advocates saying you could do all sorts of things that you want to do and you're gonna learn how to do it here. We'll teach you how to train other people to do this, other blind people. So it's a fire that is lit, that just grows and grows, um, literally to the point where one of the things that they do is they're taking census work in New York. They're trying to find blind people. Uh, it, from this point in time, it's interesting to look back where this is a time when a lot of people have the attitude that it's fine to have a shut-in. If you have a blind person in your family, and you gotta go to work, it's okay to lock them in the house, it's okay to lock them in a room. Or some people don't wanna tell other people that they have a blind family member. So the survey work is out trying to find the blind people in the city. And her training of blind people to do this work uh, is so successful that Winifred ends up just being there handling other business and the survey work across the city is being done by teams of blind people. Ann Connolly is in all of this. She is working with blind people doing you know, blind managed projects. Um, so Winifred Holt, okay, so she, she starts the Lighthouse of the Blind in New York, starts the New York Association for the Blind. Um, this, is, this is around 1905, 1907. What also is really great about her, I, that I find great, is that she's born into privilege. She doesn't have to do these things. She, there are so many other paths she could choose to do, and she is just sparked. This is her mission. She writes an article about how this all comes about. She writes this article for, um, on the formation of the New York Association for the Blind. If you look at it, it's the template for the Vermont Association for the Blind. And what I love about it is she's, she's created this thing that is just successful and so profoundly impactful for blind people. And she says, um, I've written all the simple ways this has begun because anybody can do this. I am nobody special. Granted, she did have a lot of resources to start with, but she lays out in her essay the size of the room they had. We have one table. 
And she's explaining that you could do this out of your house. You could do this like we have done it. So there's this great, interesting kind of can-do spirit in the beginning of the field where they're discovering that they can make a difference. So she's in, you know, her dad has the summer home. She comes up to Burlington in the summers. She's up here and she gives this, actually she's here in November, so there I'm wrong. She's up here in the winter. And she gives a speech at Edmonds High School about what she's done, about the formation of the New York Association of the Blind. She's doing it to encourage a formation of a similar organization in Vermont. So she gives a talk at Edmonds, November 1912. Elsie Brown, who is similar to Winifred, Elsie Brown lives in Fernhill, up end of North Prospect. That's a New York family. Uh, they come up and they summer in Vermont. They open their house up at Fernhill. I'm not sure how, Elsie's I think probably similar in age. She's another young person who's active and realizes she can make a difference. And she's very involved up here in the fallout after the um, investigation into child labor in the Winooski Mills. And she's involved in the Visiting Nurses Association. I'm thinking the VNA currently must know a lot about Elsie Brown because she's uh, their big instigator in the beginning, their big catalyst. Anyhow, Elsie Brown's at this talk that Winifred gives. Elsie Brown becomes this active force in that first year of keeping the VAB going. The VAB is formed at this talk right afterwards. Um, so Winifred Holt mentions Elsie Brown as the driver in the first year of forming the VAB. Elsie Brown disappears after that. I have to note that the first teacher who was hired to teach in Burlington is Roy Klukia. Um, he's hired by Elsie Brown and he should be mentioned because he's the first and he also disappears after two months. Uh, he teaches for just July and August 1913. He comes from the Perkins School. Elsie writes to Perkins. Vermont has been sending some of its blind students to the Perkins School in Massachusetts since like the 1840s. So that's what we have been doing um, with blind students. I'm not really sure the criteria of how somebody gets chosen to get to go to Perkins. I think they have to show a lot of promise. Um, using taxpayer money to send students to Perkins becomes a political issue like in the 1850s. So some candidates are saying like, this guy's for sending blind people away on your dime. Is that right? So that's how it's going here. Roy Klukia is one of the students that gets sent from Cambridge, Vermont, studies at Perkins. He's a standout athlete too. He comes back, does teaching, I don't know if something, I don't know if he, if, um, I'm not sure what happens with him, but Winifred, or um, Elsie Brown writes to Perkins again and says, do you have somebody else you can send us? But at the meanwhile, while this is happening in Burlington, in St. Albans, you have a, a counterpart of Winifred Holt, and I'm sorry I don't have a younger picture of her, but this is Anna Smith, the governor's wife, Edwin Smith's wife, um, this is from her obituary. I couldn't find an earlier picture, but she's from the late 19th century. Um, she's a reform-minded young woman, or yeah, young woman, and she, in St. Albans, she's involved in many reform projects or aid to the needy projects, social aid projects. She, uh, one of the interesting things she does, she hosts Minnie G. Hayes, who's a reformer, activist, well-known, nationally well-known. She speaks at the Smith home on the reform of women's clothing, corsets, and in the newspaper, they say, it's open to the public, which I think is very cool that the Smiths open their house to have this reformer there, and they say anybody can come. And the paper reports that they were happy to see that several men attended the, the talk. So Anna Smith has an aunt named Catherine Scranton. And Catherine Scranton is of the town, the city name, Scranton, PA. The Smiths are related to the Scrantons. These are two prominent railroad owning families that merge together through marriage. And I, I'm not really sure how Anna Smith knows about Ann Connolly, whether they went to Overbrook and said, who's an exceptional student? We want to be involved in the work for the blind. We want to start this in St. Albans. Can you recommend somebody? I'm not sure. Ann Connolly comes from Scranton. Uh, Anna Smith, the Smith family, has a connection to Scranton. Um, but we also know that Ann Connolly is in New York at the Lighthouse. So it's a good possibility that Anna Smith knows Winifred Holt because they're well-to-do, wealthy, socialite 
people with reform in mind. So I'm not quite sure of the connection to Anne Connolly, but Anna Smith brings Anne Connolly to St. Albans in 1913. And Anna Smith is the one who starts the first school for the blind in Franklin County by bringing Anne there. So this is the, a picture that shows up in the paper of the first school in St. Albans. This is Anne Connolly, she's 22. Uh, so this would be her coming straight from two years at the Lighthouse. It's at the Stranahan Club. Uh, let's see, it runs for three months. By Anne's own account, she said that she comes up and the Vermont Association for the Blind pays her for three months, $50 a month. And when the money runs out, uh, she, when the money runs out, the training would run out, the schools would close, because it's entirely privately funded. But she stays in the state because she wants to keep this going. And she fundraises. She is her own development person. She's raising the money. She's doing her publicity. She's a, very savvy with the media. And she stays here for two years, completely on her own efforts. The people who brought her here probably would have been okay, like, okay, we, we paid you for this much time and we did great work. The newspapers reported on the, on the classes. They also followed on what some of the people end up doing. Anne says they all became assets to their community. We have basketry going on here. Um, Anne Connolly is a genius at raising public awareness about the needs of blind people and uh, the, the capabilities of blind people. As she says, she's expanding perceptions. And um, she also knows that people don't know very much about what she's talking about. She says, she'll later describe this as an unorganized territory. She's a pioneer here. So if we step back from the Vermont that we know today to this Vermont, this Vermont is, um, or at least much of it, is agriculturally dominated, and the needs of the blind aren't too much of a concern of too many people. Um, not just the blind, maybe many others. There's a, it's not a wealthy state. Uh, there's a small state budget. There's limited money for, to support social needs. These things are brand new and being pitched to the state to support. I'm not sure when like uh, the, dest the Home for the Destitute Kids starts in Burlington, there's late 19th century efforts, um, but Anne herself talks about being here changing um, ideas, making people see what's possible. So money runs out in St. Albans. She comes down to Burlington and she raises money to start a class in this building. It's a Star Hose building on North Winooski Avenue. This starts 1914. I believe she runs a class there for four months. And the plan, what she does is three months in St. Albans, four months in Burlington. She goes back and does three months in St. Albans again. Um, she's, I could say in this period, she's, um, she's not quite as famous as she's going to get, but she's really good about writing the newspaper and saying, this is what I'm gonna be doing. All of these classes that she starts are open to the public because she wants everybody to come in and see what's possible. She also wants to encourage the public to buy the items that the students are making. And she'll explain, they're learning how to do this, but they need to be able to sell it. So your purchasing of their items will help this work. Um, she ends up, the money runs out, she ends up in these last years that she's here talking to the paper saying really the only way this is going to work in Vermont is if the state gets involved. Private funding isn't going to carry this far enough. The state needs to be involved and that's really interesting to me because the state at this point probably doesn't want to know anything about it, doesn't want to be involved, doesn't have a lot of money to spend and she's saying it out there very early, 1915. So she leaves Vermont. She takes a job with the New York Association for the Blind, who we remember was started by Winifred Holt. She's got this close association with Mrs. Holt for a long time. Um, while she's gone, we refer back to our corner over there, World War I happens. Uh, this has a, a dramatic impact on the world of blindness and also on Anne's story in Vermont. Um, the war ends up creating a wave of newly blinded soldiers, of men. Um, that in turn 
uh, fuels efforts to help them, to figure out what we can do with all these blind veterans. One of the things that develops in that is the training of guide dogs. Um, starts in Germany. Gets, I'll pick up the story later. That, has, that plays a role in Anne's time here. And during World War I, Anne teaches Braille uh, to Red Cross workers in New York. They, in turn, are creating Braille books for the blinded veterans. I threw this in, this is related to the guide dog training. This is the first newspaper article that shows up referring to the Germans training guide dogs. It's this new thing. And um, it's great. It's a funny article because there's all sorts of anti-German statements in it, but they're saying this is this genius thing that they figured out and maybe we should take this idea to the United States. And they also explain in this article, this is 1918 by the way, they explain in the article that the German people that figured out the training program got the idea by some blind beggars in, I think this, I can't remember the name of which city they're in, but there were beggars in town who had trained their own dogs to lead them from their homes to their places. So I was intrigued by that, sort of, you know, we saw them doing it, we figured we could turn it into an official program. I did some newspaper database searching in the U.S. and found a series of stories through the 19th century of people who have trained their dogs, blind guy in Atlanta, blind guy in Oklahoma, a family of blind people in another place who has a dog. So it's been, you know, dogs have been trained for a long time, but there's no official sort of program to train them. But I'm, I'm interested in the, in the sharing of an idea and how somebody can take an idea and either it spreads among people or this particular article was printed in newspapers probably in every state in the United States. There's hundreds of these that I found in the database. So the point of that being all these other states saw this same idea. This idea of the training of the dogs was everywhere. But it only was like one guy who finally said, oh, we should bring that here. So that's an interesting thing to me, along with how does somebody become forgotten in the historical record. Okay, so World War I, put a bookmark in that, the dogs. Anne's in New York, 1915 through 1923. She organizes the work for the blind in the cities of Utica, Syracuse, Watertown, Cooperstown, and the counties of Nassau and Westchester. Organizing the work for the blind. So what that involves, and this is what she did in Vermont, should explain. When she came to St. Albans, she will find the people who are going to be her um, helpers, basically. In this case, it was Anna Smith back in uh, St. Albans. She'll usually work with a church and she needs somebody to assist her and they begin to look for blind people. They put the word out, we're looking for blind people. And it, it seems a, a little crazy to me at this point from where we are, but in Vermont, and I'm sure this happened in upstate New York because she has some examples where this is still a time when people are fine with their shut-ins. Somebody's blind in the family and they're at home and they don't need to go anywhere. They have no support other than what the family can do. And so Anne's working through churches and you know, developing trust and getting people to be okay with allowing Anne to come talk to their blind family member and maybe present them with the opportunity to go to a school. Not every family agrees. Um, so the work for the blind is finding the blind people, convincing people to come to a class. If they can't physically get to the class, Anne will go to their home and work with them. And in Vermont, she had examples of working with many very elderly people who were blind who hadn't been out of their house in a long time. And as she said, um, she could at least go and have a friendly visit and lift them because social isolation is devastating. So she was, um, she was pushing for a program before the state was ready for that program. So she does all this work in New York Funds run out again, so this is the theme of her sort of financial instability, which is probably the case for women at the period in general. Uh, a blind woman who is also single, she's got to make her own way. Funds run out for the New York Association for the Blind. She joins the New York Guild for the Jewish Blind, and she starts working this new house that they open in Yonkers, and she's overseeing the workshops for women, young women and older women who are doing um, like the various handicraft work. I, I included this because they honored her. When she, when she was leaving the New York um, Association for the Blind in Yonkers, she was given this honorary travel kit by the St. Peter's Guild. And I just included it because that, that's a rare occasion when somebody honored her as she was moving on to her next work. 
Um, excuse me for a minute. I'm way behind in flipping my panels here. So she goes to work for the New York or the yeah, New York Guild for the Jewish Blind. She works there up until 1923. And another thing I want to emphasize in these groups that she's working for, like out of Vermont, I think the thing that uh, I want to emphasize to everybody is all of this is happening outside of Vermont. In Vermont, almost nothing is happening. The New York Guild for the Jewish Blind is an advanced organization at this point when Anne's working for them to the point that they already have multiple social groups of just women that, I saw one picture where they had I know, probably like 50 blind women down at the beach and they were doing, it was tug of war day. One group is dressed all in black and they're in the water and the other group's dressed all in white and they're trying to pull each other back and forth. So that's a complex social outing and Anne's part of it. She's, you know, I can't imagine how amazing it would be for her to be around blind colleagues and having this incredible day out with a group of blind women having fun at the beach. And again, I'll say, and nothing like this exists in Vermont. So she's working there. Uh, she leaves there in 1923 to start work in Virginia. Same thing. Um, organizing work for the blind. Interesting here, these segregated classes there. So she works with a black uh, teacher of the blind, Hattie Willis, who I don't know anything about her other than this, but I bet you she's got a really interesting story to look into as well. Um, Anne is paid for by the state, and then she's loaned out to different cities to organize the work. And um, it's interesting. Um, this is another unorganized area, as she would call it. This is an interesting blurb where this is her coming back, but it, she had done this exploratory trip with some other people into North and South Carolina looking at their work for the blind there. Um, it's funny because she comes back and it says that she's going to assist uh, Mrs. Carpenter in collecting the water refund. I threw that in there to show sort of the level in which they were um, aggressively trying to build their, or creatively trying to build their programs. The Roanoke Water Department had some issue where there was a water refund and uh, the Lions and the group that Ann was with approached them and said, you know, if we could have that refund, it was $15,000. It's a lot of money at the time. This is 1926, I think, or 25. Um, they, end up, they end up winning. They end up getting the money. And the money is put into building a workshop for the blind in Roanoke where they build brooms and mattresses. So it invest, it, it's an investment in this industrial center. And it's, I like it because Anne does a little bit of that when she, or a lot of that when she comes back to Vermont and uh, talks to the Burlington City Council. So this is all going on in Virginia. Um, also thinking that Anne is being exposed to a, a, a lot of diverse groups of people. <clears throat> okay, so meanwhile, back in Vermont, I've emphasized nothing's really going on. There is no work for the blind taking place. The VAB goes to sleep, as Anne says. Um, when she leaves the state, the VAB does nothing else. They, they talk about they need money, they talk about there's work to be done, they talk about the need for fundraising, but then World War I hits and uh, the VAB goes to sleep. They put their money in a bank account and just kind of turn everything on dim. Okay, so this is now 1925 that we're at. Aunt, uh, Helen Keller is touring New England to raise interest and money for the American Foundation for the Blind. That's an organization started, I think, in 1921 in reaction to the, the high rate of blinded soldiers. It's an organ they came together to try to do something. So Helen Keller's out raising money for the AFB. She tours Vermont. She comes, she has a show of blind people. So she has a, a blind violinist and some blind uh, vocalists and she does a stage show with them and she speaks at length about the devastating effects of social isolation. It's an interesting theme throughout all of it. She's attracting huge crowds. She's, you know, obviously she's a big celebrity. And um, this is a huge phrase they use all the time, help the blind to help themselves. You know, that's still something we all understand and get, but at the time it was particularly powerful because 
there's more suspicion about charity and there's more of an attitude about, you know, you're giving away things for free to people and helping them to help themselves. Um, uh, what's the Christian phrase? Teach a man to fish? It's related to that because much of this work is fueled with Christian values. Uh, the, the women who are doing this work often see themselves as doing kind of missionary work, except for Winifred Holt. In her story, she tells, this is so unusual, because there's a, there's a strong religiosity to much of uh, what is going on in these early days, or at least their sense of doing Christian charity work. Winifred Holt says, I'm at school and I learned from my religious teacher that babies go to hell and I wanted nothing more to do with this. And she puts that in her biography. That's an amazing statement to make in 1905. Anyhow, so um, Helen Keller does this tour through Vermont and her talk at, in Burlington, which I believe takes place at UVM, uh, uh, members of the VAB attend that show, that presentation, and they agree at it, they meet afterwards, and they agree that they need to revive the VAB as a statewide service delivering organization. Prior to that, they only worked in Chittenden County and Franklin County. Um, so our organization to this day marks its start, it, our, our rebirth, you could say, to this 1926 tour of Helen Keller through the state. Um, yeah. So Helen Keller's there. Anne is still in Virginia. This is great. So Anne's in Virginia, and this is her first article she writes. It's a, it shows up in the Outlook for the Blind, which is the trade journal put out by the Perkins School for the Blind uh, uh, field, the workers of the blind. And it's, it's her essay is amazing, number one, because she writes, she types, she types in Braille, and her writing is great, but she's also describing her role and what she does in her work, and it explains a lot about her mind. Um, so I'm going to read you some of the things she, one of the really interesting things she addresses is the work in an organized location versus an unorganized location. Organized are all these urban centers that she's been in. And basically in an organized place, she said, I can go in as a field teacher and do this thing with the people I'm working with and everything else is taken care of by someone else who has a job in the organization. But in an unorganized place, she has to do everything. So she writes, the unorganized territories occupy the smaller towns with a scattered population. Here the number of blind is comparatively small and the organizations for welfare work are few. Here the home teacher is the pioneer in the advancement of the cause. There are no paid workers to meet the various situations constantly arising, and the home teacher must do all the other work in, in addition to instructing pupils. It's up to the home teacher to seek out the blind as best she can. The state or association secretary and directors may be miles away. That's if there's one that exists. And even though Uncle Sam does carry news fast, the special situation cannot wait for correspondence and telephone and telegraphs are not always satisfactory. So the home teacher must solve the problem without aid. In such a community, the home teacher must educate the public for she is the only one who has the knowledge. She is the Bureau of Information and should be a living example of what a normal blind person should be. The reputation of the blind in the organization depends entirely on the conduct of a home teacher. So beware of false steps in the path of righteousness. Um, a couple of things out of there that are important to know about her is she feels strongly that the blind teach the blind best. The best education for the blind should come from a blind person. Um, that and her description here also is her being independent out in the field. This is still very much a man's world. She's an independent woman moving out here. She's blind and she's making decisions on her own out in the field. Uh, so she has a great degree of independence and authority over what she's doing. She goes on and describes some of the qualities that are needed, and I'll just read a few. Um, she goes about knowing various typewriting, different scripts, the different handicrafts you should know. Um, she says it's important to have common sense, good judgment, tact, diplomacy, a good moral character, patience, perseverance, a good disposition, a good sense of humor, plenty of initiative, and you should be neat in appearance and have a magnetic personality. <laughs> so, and, and this is, um, she's a representation, she's a representative of blind people. And 
I mentioned this guy, Roy Klukia, earlier. He was the first person hired in Burlington. He leaves Burlington for a job with the uh, Wisconsin School for the Blind. And I found a letter in the Perkins correspondence, in the Perkins archives, where the director of Perkins, uh, Roy Klukia, is a graduate. Okay. How many minutes? Ten left? Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to jump way ahead. Um, this is an important article, and I'm always curious if anybody in Vermont read it. So she leaves Virginia after writing that article. She leaves her career, and she takes on a new career of selling insurance in Pennsylvania. Um, it's a correspondence course through the Hadley School. Hadley correspondence. She meets Morris Frank in this period. He's the first guy with the trained guide dog. He, he brings the program back to Tennessee, the seeing eye. And she does this for a while, and then she's hired by Helen Keller to be her typist uh, for six weeks. So Anne moves out into Helen Keller's house in Long Island and is a typist for six weeks. But I think that was a scouting mission because there is this plan. Um, Helen Keller is a rep for the AFB. And in September 27, 1927, Anne is asked by the American Foundation for the Blind to return to Vermont to organize the work for the blind. And this is all being done with the goal of impressing the state to give a large appropriation to support work for the blind in Vermont. So I think that Anne's out at Helen Keller's place, so, Anne, so Helen Keller can check her out and give her the stamp of approval. Then Anne comes back up here with Charles Hayes, who's an official at the AFB, and they meet with state officials. They meet with the governor. They meet with this guy, William Dyer, who I might not get the chance to talk about, but he's great. Um, and she gives this impassioned speech about how this work needs to be resumed. Um, it is her work. She feels ownership about it that she left it behind in 1914. So they authorize her to raise up to $5,000 um, to go around and raise awareness about this and to do a survey in the state. This is all being done so the state can see if there's really a need for um, state support in the program. The American Foundation of the Blind pays for Anne's work during this time. This is an address she has in uh, Burlington at the time. And I add these little bits. This is a bit about uh, the meeting with the state. This kind of headline, Miss Connolly coming back to help the blind, that shows up in newspapers around Vermont. She's known about and people are excited that she's coming back. Uh, right after she has that meeting, the flood hits and she says no one in the state can help her. She needs an assistant to drive her around the state. So she said, if I, I could have left the state because everybody just kind of ignored her. They were hit by a disaster. Said, if I left the state, I felt that the work would just be dropped. So she contacts the AFB. They come back up, and someone drives her around the state for uh, several months. That's a letter, which we won't have time to go into, but it's a letter that somebody wrote into this column in the Free Press where they encountered Ann Connolly out in the wild. Um, I say out in the wild, out in the field. She's doing this radio giveaway program for the AFB which is great because they're connecting blind people who've been hit by the flood to radio so they can be connected to the world. Today we have something called the SMART program where we teach the use of iPads and iPhones and whatnot so, uh, so blind people can be connected to the world. So this is an earlier version, 1927. She then, 1928, she's trying to build up this case to get state funding. She writes another article in the Outlook for the Blind. Is the Vermont Association for the Blind essential? The answer is yes. Uh, she or one of the, I love this. This is one of the first things she organizes, um, an out of state trip for blind women to this vacation house that Helen Keller set up in, in New York. And I can only imagine that being rather shocking to read or some of the Vermonters at the time read it and like, really? They're going away on a vacation? So that's pretty cool. She also does this, she talks to schools. She's all over the state talking. And one of the things she does is she can tell people that she can tell what coins they have in their hands by the sound of two coins hitting each other. So they're impressed by that. And this guy, they write in the article that they, that the guy, that she guessed that he was about five feet, 11 inches and weighed 200 pounds, but she failed to note his color of skin because she said, frankly, that means nothing whatsoever to her. I thought that was a very cool statement to add in there too. Um, then that little article on the other side, um, when she's in Burlington, she moves her classes to City Hall to raise awareness, which is just such a cool PR move. She gets room 17 in City Hall. 
the VAB opens up their office there and she opens up her training school there that she wants tourists to Burlington to know about to be able to come in because she is always uh, has the focus on raising awareness of blindness. Um, so we're in 1928. 1929, this is just a quick article that's important to see. This comes up in the paper. A recent survey done. New era starting. The era of handicrafts is ending. New jobs are opening up. Blind people now can be taught to do kindergarten work, stenography, dictaphone operating, social service work, editing. There's a whole new uh, field of vocations opening up. And so this is important to know because handicrafts are the center of what the lighthouse does. So we're at 1929. Up to this point, Anne's just been promoting, uh, trying to impress the state that there's this need for a state appropriation to keep this work going. And the return of Winifred Holt, mother, she's now married. This is her in 1929. I suspect she's always had a contact to Anne because she comes here in the summers, Anne's here, and Winifred Holt had this huge impact on Anne when she was younger. Winifred Holt at some point meets with Anne. Anne's doing all this promotional work around the state. Winifred Holt says, you know, you should build a lighthouse in Vermont. I mean in Burlington, not just in Vermont, in Burlington. Up to this point, there isn't necessarily a big plan like that. Anne's just surveying the state, She's visiting a lot of people and doing various work, but this is now suddenly a big project. This is a central project and Winifred Holt suggests build a lighthouse in Burlington and she lays out $2,000 for it, which is a huge sum of money. So you can see here the governor's part of this meeting. He's in on it. Uh, Winifred Holt's behind it. She has a lot of clout. She's a very influential person in the world of the blind. Her husband's in on it Anne's at the meeting. They then take this uh, idea to the VAB. The VAB meets and hears about it. They vote, yes, this is great. So Anne is now sent out to raise oh, something like $10,000 across the state to kick off the lighthouse. Um, she's right, and the, the idea is that the lighthouse would be this industrial training center in Burlington in the Taft School on Pearl Street. That's what they wanted in. Part of it would be boarding. Counties would send their blind people to Burlington to be trained there, and then they would hopefully go out and find employment with what they've been trained in. It's a very expensive plan. A lighthouse is gonna be expensive, and, um, but it's okay, Anne's okay to, to work on this. And, oh, just a minor thing happens too. September, the stock market crashes, and Anne leaves for months, she's been planning this. So in the background, she's planning to leave the state to go train with a new guide dog. Okay, so she leaves the state, goes to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, meets her guide, her new dog, German Shepherd Betty. Uh, this, while she's away training, she's writing letters back to these Vermont cities saying, this is what I'm doing. I'm in this program. I'm getting a guide dog. It's a new program. It's going to be my new eyes. When I come back, let's set up a date and we can have a meet Betty day at City Hall. She's so clever with how she presents what she's doing and introducing people to this new idea of a dog guide. People haven't seen this before. Up to this point, Anne, Helen Keller, they've been guided with a human guide, somebody with them. So Anne announces to people, I'm training, I'm going to come back. Betty's expensive. It costs $400 out of Anne's pocket for Betty, equal to over 7000 of today's money. So it's a big expense and Anne makes everybody known, or lets everybody know that she's doing this. Um, she comes back with Betty. And it's interesting because today we see guide dogs, you know, we have one in the room with us, we're familiar. At this time, people were not familiar, and people were stunned to see a dog guiding Anne. The description of her leaving her house the first day is great, where people came out crowded around her, a policeman showed up because he was worried about her, they, and she, Betty guided her from her apartment on Bradley Street to City Hall. And everybody was amazed and cheering that they got there, and it's this, it's this great description of people having their minds expanded. They've never seen this before, and Anne's experiencing independence that she's never had before. It's a big deal. And she knows, I think one of the amazing things about it is that she's aware she's doing this. She is living an example for people to see. 
She's on an upward trajectory. In the background, there is trouble going on. Got the stock market crashes in 1929, or in the fall. This is right after the Lighthouse Project is approved. So the economy starts to, the, Vermont is hit by it. I know the comments always that Vermont was impoverished, so they never felt the depression. People are talking about in the paper within that year, the depressed economy is hitting Rutland and various places. So this becomes harder for her to raise money. VAB in this time is a temporary operating status. They really need the state to come in with some funding. And they believe that if the state doesn't come in with the funding, it's likely that the work will just be dropped. So the VAB is really hoping to satisfy the state. Uh, William Dyer is the commissioner of public, um, public welfare. He's, uh, he is an old Vermonter from Rutland. He's been a longtime public servant. He's in state government. He is a guardian of Vermont payers, a tax pay, Vermont taxpayers taxes, I guess, making sure the taxes are going to the right thing. Um, from articles he's written, I know he's suspicious of outsiders with expensive ideas. And he said, you know, these people will come up with an idea and they will target a certain community and they'll use propaganda and they will elicit sympathy and empathy. And then those people in that town will develop programs that want to be paid for and before you know it, our backs up against the wall. He's talking about this in prison reform that he's involved with in the state. When he's the commissioner of public welfare and he's talking with Ann Connolly in this lighthouse project, it's entirely that. These are outside people with big money proposing a big project in Burlington. So Dyer doesn't come out against it, but I know he's got to be suspicious. Plus, I have a suspicion that Ann Connolly might um, rankle him a bit. She's opinionated, she's outspoken, she believes she is the expert. Um, so Lighthouse is expensive, it's going to cost the state money each year to keep going. Plus, I know from the Perkins archives that there are complaints being raised about Ann by some of the volunteers. Some of them don't like working with her. Don't know exactly why they had complained about her to William Dyer. There's kind of this, Dyer's collecting ammo against Ann. Complaints by some of the trained people, some of the blind people in Vermont who Ann trained, who then went, got training and couldn't find a job because there's no jobs in the state for them. There is no setup. It's either the public are gonna buy the things they make, the state maybe, the state's not involved yet in doing any of that, so they're writing letters back complaining. I got this training and there's nothing for me to do here. And all the money that the state has, has is going to Ann Connolly. So they're very um, gossipy letters. Um, Ann was down in Rutland and I went and said, why can't you come teach? And she wouldn't teach. And I, be, I believe she might not even know how to teach anymore. She's, that's a letter written by somebody that she's taught. So they're, they're uh, undermining her from behind. And then she, Ann has met these two women Gladys Stearns and Priscilla Parsons from Johnson. They're both blind and they hit it off. They're good friends. And Ann says, you know, you're both great. You already have this training. She approves them to go to Perkins for extra training because she wants them to be part of her staff at the lighthouse in Burlington. She needs help. She's saying, I can't do all this myself. So she's fed them on this idea that they need to go do this. And that all gets back to William Dyer, um, that Anne has approved them, and he says to them, Anne wasn't approved to do that. She had no authority to tell you that. He's in charge. Once this money, because the state has offered, I think, a couple thousand, just 5,000 mentioned, once that money's out there and the state's involved, they are much more calling the shots, and William Dyer's really looking at, what is she doing? And all of this is building up, hoping to get a bigger state appropriation in 1930. So this is all going in the background. This is 1929, May 1930. William Dyer realizes the lighthouse is expensive. He writes to the American Foundation of the Blind, says, will you send an expert up here to give us an assessment on this project? They come up here and they say, a lighthouse isn't feasible in a place like Vermont. A lighthouse works in an urban center. Vermont's rural, spread apart. You're gonna to have to pay for transportation for people coming up to Burlington and back. You should focus on home teaching. The teaching should be individual in the home, not a group center. That works better for an urban place. This is Anne's entire project and it's canceled. Like it's, she learns about the cancellation of the lighthouse project at the annual meeting. 
she's raising money for it like two days before. So it's, she's not made aware. They're going to meet and make this decision without her. The person from the AFB insists that they bring Anne in and let her know they're changing the plans and she can resign or she can take a lesser position and they're gonna hire a sighted replacement. And she's devastated, completely de I know this from a letter that she writes. And she says she cannot believe, because so the AFB expert says Ann Connolly has to be at this meeting if she's gonna lose her job and this project's gonna change. She's your field teacher for the state. So they bring her in and Ann says, they're all ashamed and embarrassed. They don't wanna face me. They bring her in and she, she learns that they're gonna make this change. And um, if you know the term geographic determinism, this is it. This is how we end up with the VAB that does home teaching. Um, she's, she demands to know, which one of you made the decision to replace me with a sighted teacher? And they all kind of point at each other. And they point at William Dyer, and William Dyer says, no, she did. And he points at the AFB expert, and she stands up, and she's, she, um, by Anne's description, she has to defend herself. And she said, a state like Vermont would benefit with a sighted teacher who has to drive all around. They have a limited budget. From the state's perspective, they have a limited budget. William Dyer says other states have budgets of tens of thousands of dollars. Vermont works with thousands. We have to figure out how to make this money stretch. VAB knows if the state pulls out, it's entirely privately funded, it's gonna be limited. It can't be a statewide service. So I'm sure they all look at this like, we can't keep Ann Connolly as the state field teacher. She, she needs an assistant, she's more expensive for them. And, and she's told, Ann writes this, three people from my um, board came and said, you cost us too much money. We can make more money or we can do better with the state appropriation with a sighted teacher. And we told the state that. So she's angry. She was thrown under the bus by women in her own group. And she writes this to Winifred Holt, like, can you believe this? And she says, she, her letter full of all of her bile about this, she writes to her friend Winifred Holt because Winifred's behind this big project. So Anne writes all this, you know, sad story of what has happened. But in the end, she says, you know, I've heard nothing bad about the work I've done, but they're telling me I've done nothing in the state. They have told me not to teach anymore, but they're also telling me they're helping me find a job out of state to teach. And she said, you know, I pay taxes here. This is where I live. I'm gonna stay and fight the fight. She literally has that, and she does. So she stays. This is a bit about you know, the work being now conducted by sighted teachers. She stays and she continues to go around the state and uh, tell people, hey, they're firing me. It's crazy. So um, Anne, Gladys, and Priscilla formed this business in Burlington, the Blind People's Quaint Shop. Anne quickly hooks up with Burlington High School gets a deal with the principal to have, blind, or to have students in the school come and read to the blind people in Chittenden County in their homes. They sell products out of the shop made by blind people. Um, this is great too. They form their own agency, uh, the Vermont League of Blind Citizens. And this is just some emphasis. They say the days of handicrafts are over. We need to have real jobs for blind people. This is, this is now moving into the depression too, 1931. Blind people for blind people, that's very much Anne's position that she learned from the lighthouse. Um, so they form this new organization and they then have to say, we're also going to work with the state. We're cooperating with the VAB and the state program, but nobody who joins our group can be part of the VAB. So I think that's very funny. They exclude them right away. Um, you can't be cited to be part of this group. Um, and then they, they swing into action. There's an article, 10 days into their formation, Anne's out in Waterbury helping a party or a family she also helps a man down in Southern Vermont who's recently blinded. Uh, they developed this annual Christmas party that like lasts past all of them. I think uh, it goes into the 60s. Um, and also, this is a quick side story. She praises Myrtle Aldrich, the Northeast Kingdom, as the Helen Keller of Vermont. And if you don't know Myrtle Aldrich, look her up. She's a great story. Um, and through all of this, Anne is walk going all over Vermont with Betty and she's famous. She's well known. They're celebrities. Kids do fundraisers for them and they have bookmarkers with Ann and Betty on their bookmarkers. Um, and the greatest thing about Ann Connolly is she is 100% aware of what she's doing. She's living this model 
of a, an independent blind person that no one has seen. And in her essay that she wrote in 1926, she said that when you're in an unorganized area, you don't just have the work for the blind to do, you have to work for, on the minds of the sighted because they're seeing something new for the first time. They're having their understandings expanded. So she's living this role to show what is possible. This is, <laughs> this is great. Uh, so she's replaced by the sighted per person, Roberta Townsend from the AFB. Roberta picks up where Anne leaves off and her first project, this shows up in this magazine. They do wayside selling in Proctor and it's cool. This, this is a school donated by Dorothy Canfield Fisher and they build this kind of cooperative workshop for blind men to sell their products out of. And the article goes on about how she made it, how they put it together. This letter over here comes from Anne and her two friends who made that, uh, the Vermont League of Blind Citizens, I think, and they fire off this letter and it says, oh, you want to know who's responsible for all of this? You know, this, all of the stuff that these guys in here know how to do, Anne taught them. So they're going saying the blind person taught them all of these things. Then you got rid of the blind person, you hired the sighted person, and the money from the state's going to the sighted person, and the blind guys are left to try to sell what they can. Oh, and by the way, we still want to work with them, but just to set the record straight. So it's a funny letter of them being incredibly scathing, but I, rightly so, they're angry. Another interesting shift that happens, the reports that start coming out from the, the VAB in the state, from uh, Roberta Townsend as the sighted replacement, she answers to the state. She answers to William Dyer, and her emphasis is on men. Men, a man's job in a manly world. Um, blind men to take his righted place in a, as a useful contributing member of the community. There's such an overt emphasis on working with men that I could not say something. I, I saw it and I was like, oh, I've never seen this in any descriptions of Anne. And I went back and started looking at how much influence um, was on Anne to work with women, to work with women's groups, to prefer uh, or, or to show a preference in working with blind women. She worked with everybody, but most of the reports that she gave, she's talking about a blind woman, young girl she's helped. She's in women's clubs and there is this stark shift that the emphasis on the work for the blind is for blind men. And you really don't hear much about any blind women being helped after that, or at least not in this period I'm looking at. And in the meantime, moves to 106 Cherry Street, which is somewhere very close to us here. Um, opens her own shop, Ann Connolly's Handy Shop, Handicraft Shop sometimes too. These are ads she had in the paper. Picnic lunches put up, tasty combinations delivered. She was making these lunches for people downtown and also for students at the Converse School. Also, she was looking for a few ambitious women to introduce her products into every home in Vermont. Betty, her dog, dies. Chokes, they think, on a bone splinter. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. Betty dies. Um, her second dog is Pellerin, 1931. This is, a pic this is the greatest picture of Anne. Came from the CNI Inc. Institute. Um, Anne is involved in Burlington. She's, uh, she has her shop. She's involved in bringing in the blind players of Brooklyn, who she was part of founding long ago. She brings them in. They perform. She petitions City Hall to get exclusive vending rights for blind people to set up at like games and concerts and whatnot. Uh, 1935, oops, I think I missed one piece of that. Well, Pellerin, her second dog, is poisoned. Yeah, and they, they did an autopsy and they say this is either a malicious act, somebody intentionally poisoned her dog or the dog ate uh, rat poison, like meat that had been tainted by arsenic. Pellerin dies. Um, she, Pellerin, her second dog and her third dog are paid for by people in Burlington who feel sorry for her, who see how independent she was. She gets a third dog, Mimi. She starts another tour of the state with Mimi. All of these articles are written about what she's doing and what she is doing is being a living example. Um, tours women clubs, this is great because I think she understands she's going to be written out of the history. So this is an account of her speaking at one of the groups. This, tour she does at 35, says, what has she been doing? For the past five years, Ann Connolly has proved what a blind person can really do. With a lot of courage and scanty financial resources, she started a store in just one block from Church Street in Burlington, 
Opposite her small store was a large school, and so she connected the idea of selling penny candy, and the children soon became eager to go to Miss Connolly's shop. She increased the store supplies to magazines, papers, party favors, novelties, and even luncheons for the children. Um, she's, a, she's a model. She's living what can be done. Uh, organizes social outings for her friends. She operates her shops. As it's toward the close of the 30s, you see less of her in the paper. She's dealing with thieves. These kids are stealing a lot of stuff from her, from her shop. And she's also sick. And her illness worsens each year. The people know this, that she's sick and she's getting worse. And she passes away in 1939. Uh, this is some of her obituary. Miss Ann Connolly, 50, for years with a familiar figure on the Burlington streets with her seeing-eyed dog. She died. Uh, this is about her will. She, she leaves her will to the VAB, so she's kind of our first bequest. Uh, and she leaves money aside for her dog, to care for her dog after she dies so it can go to another blind person. And she leaves her typewriter and other goods to other blind people. That letter on the side is from a Burlington resident who loved her and wrote about her. Um, something I think is very cool is that people knew she was dying. Two months before she dies, the St. Albans paper honors her by running this Remember, One, Remember When article, 25 years ago when Ann Connolly opened the first class for the blind in Vermont. People felt clearly very bad that she had lost her position. Uh, and then this is how she gets forget, forgotten. She dies in 39. She, in the 50s, whenever this was, I think this is about the 1950s, the newspaper runs in the remember when section. You know, 25 years ago this happened. They remember she brought first white cane to Vermont. This came back with her second dog. The Lions Club of Newark gave her a new souvenir thing called a white cane red tip. She's the first one to bring it to Vermont. Um, they remember when Betty died. They remembered when the quaint shop opened. Quaint shop opened. They remembered when Anne started the first classes in City Hall. 50 years later, they remember that she opened this first school for the blind in St. Albans. That's it. <laughs> One last thing. This statement is a statement she made about um, you know, traveling Vermont with a guide dog. And her article is called, I Walk with a Dog. And she said, currently in Vermont, not every train will let me take my dog with me in my seat. I have to check it in with baggage. And she said, but we must put up with some inconveniences when we are blazing a new trail. She was so aware that the state had yet to catch up with where she is. And the program, her best ideas are our services that we offer today. Our organization lives and delivers services that she was talking about but they weren't able to fund back in 1900, whatever. Um, so she amazes me in that she had such a vision for what could be, uh, and she struggled just to be an exemplary person to help uh, elevate minds here in the state. This is her name in Braille. Okay, there you go. Any questions? Sorry, you wanna go? None. Yes. Oh, yes. Sarah. Uh -huh. Well, um, it's not so much a question, but I, I couldn't read Catherine McSweeney's letter. Yeah. Enough. I don't know if it's revealed within the letter, but she was not only writing that letter, but she was one of the first female physicians um, trained at UVM. Oh, that's interesting. So she, McSweeney, yeah. I, Part of the famous McSweeney family yeah. of physicians. Yeah. I didn't know that, but I bet you she helped Anne maybe she when she was she sick was in the end. They would put ads in the paper saying Ann Connolly needs things like they're asking the community to help her. So it was very known that she was chronically ill. You had a question? Um, yeah, just do you know how um, she got around transportation wise? I mean, not all. Yeah, right. There's not a lot of comment about that. I know she had an assistant. Sometimes um, I, she was in a car. I know they were driven. When Mrs. Smith, Anna Smith, who brings her the, here in 1913, um, when she dies, Ann Connolly writes this letter saying, like, she calls Mrs. Smith her pal. And she said, the most fun I ever had in the state was when she and I were palling around, like, figuring this out. So I picture them in a car going through the dirt roads. Later, they'll say Ann Connolly traveled from Burlington to wherever just with her dog independently. So that must have been mind blowing to people, too. Yes. Um, the 
you know, one of the things I like about history is uh, uh, not only learning about the past, but thinking about how it applies today. Mm -hmm. And I have two questions about today. Yep. Uh, approximately how many blind people are there in Vermont today? That's a great question. I don't know the exact answer. I know that we say there are around 15,000 visually impaired people in the state. Visually impaired. Right. Different than blind. Right. And that's a good point because Anne, when she would do these surveys, some of the critics, one of the students she trained who criticized her said, these surveys are all inaccurate. Like we can't count on her because she's counting people in there who aren't completely blind because Anne was looking at low vision which we do now. We are Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Right. So there was a lot of... changed the name to Vision Impaired. Right? They added VI just in the last like 20 years or yeah, 30 yeah, years or something. But relatively yes. recently, yes. history point of view. Yep. And partly because there's a reaction to the word blind. Right. And more people probably in the state are, are visually impaired. And so to this day, there are many people that might not right. want to okay. approach us. 15,000, more or less. Yes, yeah, supposed to double by 2030. And um, uh, children mm -hmm. that are blind or visually impaired. I, I once visited the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind, mm -hmm. which is a really interesting place. I've often wondered and have done some research, but never really, I kind of bungled through it, you know, didn't get the answer. But what is a, a deaf or blind student today where do they, does, does Vermont have a school like Florida does? Or how do they get educated? No, today we have a children's services program and our staff would work, depending on when we would hear about a baby maybe, maybe they know right away and maybe we hear quickly that there's been an infant who has a vision impairment. We will start working with the family as soon as we can. Um, I think initially it's partly to just reassure the parents that there are experts here who can help you. Um, I've heard that from parents. We didn't know what to do and so and so showed up and just let us know it's going to be okay. Um, as far as specifically what happens, there's age appropriate interventions and teaching and it begins, um, you know, we have people working with infants now. Uh, we have worked with infants all the way, helping them all the way through high school and they go to college. Um, so I, I don't know if that answered your question. There is no school in the there state. Is, there is no school. No, the student will go to school, okay. go to a public school, and our teachers will work with them in the school. Right. Or, so, yep. I mean, there, there's a lot of history about the benefit of mainlining right. the, the school. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, only I know that there's this, uh, an effort that mainlining was beneficial and that they were saying that in 1907. Right. Um, the Overbrook School that Anne went to had a kindergarten and they early on started saying um, students should be in, uh, as much as they can, a blind student should be in a regular school. Um, that idea grows. Winifred Holt was very much into that uh, main, mainstreaming. Um, and Anne was too. Anne was trying to demonstrate like I can be involved in society like everyone else. Uh, she made that point of doing a year at the normal school so she could be just among sighted students. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why do you think she uh, lived in so many places in Burlington? I know she was in George Street, North Street, right. Bradley, Cherry Street. I'm not sure. That, I, I, I think maybe because like I know they get rooming in places um, at a discount. They'll find somebody, we can give you this house. They had an office for one place on Colchester Avenue because the guy who owned the building had somebody blind in his family and gave him a discount. So I think maybe their lease was up and they had to find another place that could give them a deal. I'm guessing, yeah. Thank you. John. Yeah, sure. Uh, Thank you, everybody. We have some refreshments for those of you. And if you have any other questions, hmm. please talk to him. Individually, we need to sort of move out of the school. They've been so kind to lend us space. We have charge. But I remember you. How are you? Good to see you. Thank you. You came all the way across the state over here. Cool.